we have a manhood crisis. Apart from Jesus Christ, the God-man, you will never truly know how to be a real man, a godly man. I found out that being a drill instructor to your family and a driven taskmaster on the job didn't make you a man. It made you a bully. Over time, over several years, those periods of, of sobriety got shorter and shorter, and it got to the point at the end where it wasn't just daily, it was all day, every day. You see, for my life, I had given up a lot of years. And for God to restore those, I had no idea how he was ever going to do that. It was really hard to show them the love because all the hurt that they showed me, like at first I wanted just to get right back at them. But God kept telling me, show who I am, they'll see the light of Jesus in you. When boys try to declare themselves men, they most often just consume bigger toys and they call it manhood. That means more women, more beer, more money, more success. And the results are entitlement over responsibility. The results are boys that can shave. God revealed to me all these men in my life that I could look up to and say, that's what a Christ-like man is. As a man, there's this kind of myth that you always got to have it right. And when you know that you don't, it can create this insecurity that we all have. And so for me, scripture was the way I started warring with that effectively. I think God's really continued to work on my heart to what that looks like to be surrendered, completely relying on him. God wanted you to put on display for this world his glory and what what it means to be a man and it is time for us to reject this world's definition and to accept the biblical definition of manhood you see every single man we have been called to be provider protector prophet priest and servant king and the reality is when men stand up and act like men godly men then everyone flourishes Hey, good morning, everybody. We wanted to promo our uh, men's study coming up, uh, men and teen boys study, uh, Be a Godly Man. And then they sent me up right after, you know, on purpose, on purpose, because, uh, you know, take a look at me. I'm pretty much, right? Um, so, hey, good morning, you guys. Uh, welcome to the journey. Uh, hey, my name is Andrew, and uh, I always used to say that I, uh, I'm our PACE team leader, and I do youth and schools work here at The Journey, but I can no longer say that. Uh, I stepped down last week, and uh, now I'm just Andrew, member of The Journey, and uh, going to continue to do youth work with you guys. But uh, I can no longer say my old intro. That's weird. That's weird. Yeah. Hi, Ivan. Hi, Ivan. Thanks, buddy. Well, hey, let me start off with this morning. Um, we hope that every one of you got one of these cards that says bless on it. If you have one, raise it up for me. Yeah, okay, great. If you did not, Miss Nadine in the back has some, uh, and we can get one of these to you, but you are uh, going to need this later on in our service. We have a special task for you to do with these, uh, which is gonna help you, help you learn something amazing today, I'm sure. So if you don't have one of these, uh, Nadine in the back has them, and you can walk back and grab one, okay? Hey, uh, this weekend was a lot of fun for me. I, uh, I got to have my brother come into town and visit, and this morning I had to say goodbye to him. So took him to the bus station. I heard there was a bus station in town, but I had never been. Uh, I just drove past it, but buses do come there. And I dropped him off, and he got picked up. But it was a lot of fun. I saw half of you at City Market yesterday, it felt like, and it was fun to introduce you to him. And he had to leave early this morning, otherwise he would have stayed at church. But um, he, it was great for him to be here and see the town and see my people and meet some of you guys uh, in town. Either at City Market, we met some of you, and some of you, the rest of you, it felt like at Prodigals. So uh, that was a lot of fun. All right, well, our three cards are still the same. So uh, we have our welcome card if you are new. Uh, we want to welcome you to the journey and get connected with you. So our uh, red um, is our communication card. Our green is how to get involved at the journey. If that's something you want to do, sign up for a service team or get involved. And then uh, blue is still praise and prayer requests. So find those in the back and uh, fill out the appropriate ones. Hey, we would like to remind you guys, it's been a little while since we plugged it. Um, right now, media is still available, still available. It's a free gift to every person who uh, attends our church. Uh, and so it's a great resource. Um, many of you have already signed up to receive this free unlimited access to Right Now Media. 
the world's largest library of video-driven Bible study resources. They have fun shows for kids, studies on books of the Bible, training videos on leadership, and much more. Um, so getting started is easy. Stop by the welcome desk to sign up. There is a QR code uh, to get on that resource. One thing on that resource is a study that we're going to start, and uh, we're trying to see gather interest, um, and that is our Be a Godly Man series. It's a resource that we found on Right Now Media, and um, myself and Fa Phil Waylitz, one of our youth group leaders, uh, feel like it would be a really good series to do with our youth group boys and uh, the dads of those boys who, who want to come and join and do it together, actually, um, father and son. And so we are gathering information about it and um, interest, and we're going to set a, a time. But there is an interest sheet in the back by the welcome desk. So if you, uh, your, your child and you as a father would be interested in that, let us know. We want to find a time that works for everybody to meet. And uh, it's a five-series class, five sessions. And uh, we're really excited to, to tackle this topic, kind of a, a tough topic, a lot of different uh, views at it, but we want to look at it from a biblical perspective, and Right Now Media seems to have a really good resource that we're going to use as a, as, as a discussion guide, okay? So if you're interested, please let us know. Talk to me or Phil, uh, and then sign up in the back and just put your name on the list, and we'll get connected with you. All right, women of the journey, give me a woo! <laughs> All right. Hey, there's an exciting new opportunity for you guys this fall. It's in the works. Um, uh, it's a discipleship, teaching, and serving uh, group uh, community for women and girls of all ages called Women at the Journey. Watch for details over the next couple of months, right? So that is an exciting opportunity coming up for you guys, Women at the Journey. See our summit one day at a time is approaching. The virtual watch, par watch party is coming up soon, July 10th to 12th. Uh, we're going to have it live streamed here daily at 9.30 a.m. here at The Journey. And everyone is welcome to attend, not just those who attend CR. I would be like, hey, everyone who attends CR, give me a woo-woo. But that would break the code of CR because it's anonymous. So I'm not going to do that. <laughs> Unless you're Ivan and you want to hoot and holler and let everybody know. Um, so, but, but, but come, come check out the CR Summit. I actually got to go to the CR Summit last year in person, live in, in California, and it was amazing. Uh, amazing ministry, really uh, great leaders, great leadership, and a great resource. So that is happening starting uh, this week, daily at 9.30 here. Finally, Summer Supper. We have another Summer Supper, uh, July 31st at 6 p.m. Want to just plug that and put that on your calendars. Sign up via the announcement email or stop by the welcome desk. Uh, our ministry focus is the Henderson family, missionary family. Uh, you, a lot of you who've been attending a while know them. They like to come back and update us on what's going on, and our church supports them uh, through prayer and financially. So we get to hear more about what's going on in their ministry, the Henderson, Henderson sorry, not Henderson, <laughs> Henderson family on July 31st at 6 p.m. And I would be remiss, Nadine mentioned there is a sign-up sheet. It's not on my list, but I was told to mention it. For nursery, uh, we are still in need of a few more nursery volunteers. We appreciate those who have signed up already. It's amazing. We're, uh, we're in the home stretch. We have a few left. That's also on the back at the welcome desk. All right, I think that's all I got for you guys. Thank you. We are glad you're here and hope you enjoy the rest of our service. Well, good morning. Hopefully you had a great week and uh, did something to celebrate Independence Day. The, the 4th of July is not just an opportunity to be off work and to barbecue and hang out with people. It's actually um, a recognition and celebration of the fact that we signed a Declaration of Independence and worked towards being our own country and uh, freedom from the crown if you uh, remember your history. So hopefully you did that. And uh, just before we really get into things, uh, let's pray together. You know, if you're um, physically able and so inclined, would you join me on your knees?
Father God, we do come before you this morning again in the name of your Son, our Savior Jesus. And God, I thank you for your spirit that binds us together as one. And we recognize you as the supreme one. And God, we, um, we just count it a privilege to live when we do and especially where we do. God, thank you for the great freedom that we enjoy here in America. Thank you for the freedom today to talk about you, to say the name of Jesus, to read your word, and to open it together. God, I ask that you would so work in us that um, you would begin to change our families and our church and our community. And God, that you would just um, energize those who are truly following you through Jesus Christ, that we might... um, be the source of stability and of the future. God, we, um, we just thank you again. Lord, and there's um, so much that's just not right and so much turmoil everywhere. And so we press into you. We ask that you would um, give us uh, strength, wisdom, endurance, perseverance, that each one of us would um, would walk in paths of righteousness, and we can only do that when we let you be our shepherd, and so I pray that that would happen. God, we just, um, we look forward to Jesus' return. We look forward to, um, to the, the, just the excitement and the reality of that, and, and ultimately, those who know Christ to one day see him and be like him. And yet, God, we thank you that you're not slow concerning that promise, but that you tarry that more would come to faith. And so we thank you for your heart for people and and, uh, that you so loved the world that you gave your only begotten son that whosoever believeth in him should not perish but have everlasting life. So, God, we just give you the glory and the honor and the praise and recognize that This room and this time is not about this country, although we thank you again for America. But God, this is about our ultimate citizenship, which is in heaven, if we make you our Lord and Savior. We ask that you would speak to us as only you can through your word. We pray in Jesus' name. Amen. That's getting harder and harder to do. So there's, um, there's no judgment if you're getting to a point where that's impossible to do. So the getting down I can do with using that speaker is the getting up that I sometimes need help for. Hey, we're going to spend the next five weeks uh, talking about a concept uh, that I was exposed to about a year ago. So a year ago, our good friend Paul Mitten, who's the executive minister for Converge, uh, an association of churches that we choose to belong to, believing that we're better together and that there's certain resources that um, by, by banding with other like-minded churches, we can, uh, we can utilize and, and gain and help each other. Anyway, Paul called me about a year ago, about right now, and said, hey, how can I be praying for you? And I s- talked about a couple of things. I said, well, you could pray that Cheryl would be nicer. That would be a really... <laughs> No, I really said that. It's still on my list. Cheryl's my wife, if you don't know it. She's not here today. She's left me again. So anyway, um, I, we talked about a couple things, and I finally said, you know, Paul, my, my real heart in prayer is that there would be a wave of growth in our church and that that growth wouldn't be because... Um, of some kind of problems in some church in Craig, but that that growth would be because because we're being who we should be and you're drawing people to yourself through us as we lift the name of Jesus up. I pray that the next wave of growth would be of new people coming to faith. And um, so Paul prayed, and about a week later, through Paul, I got an invitation to be part of a, a cohort, an association of uh, process with 
Wheaton University and Converge, the association of churches that we're a part of. And the process is intended to help a church become, become more focused and intentional about sharing their faith. Um, it's recounted in that process, and it's so true of us that many churches are very good at connecting with their community. We're known in this community for, um, for being the, the hands and the heart of Jesus. We're known in this community for helping people in their times of need and of distress. And it would just be my prayer that in, within that reality of connecting well with our community, whether it's through Project One or Love, Inc. or the Pregnancy Center or Awana or CR or any of the many things we do, that in addition to, to continuing that and becoming even better at that, we would become more vocal and focused and intentional about sharing why we're doing that. And, and we're doing that because we have the cart and the horse in the right place. We're, we're not this loving, friendly, helpful community of believers because we're trying to gain God's favor or stay in God's favor. We're doing it because we have God's favor through Jesus Christ. That it is by grace we have been saved through faith and not of ourselves. It's a gift of God, not by works, not by going to church or being baptized or taking communion or being good, not by works, lest anyone should be able to boast, but by God's grace through faith in Christ Jesus. And then it, the last part, the caboose on that, on that passage is this. For we are God's workmanship, created in Christ Jesus unto good works, which he has prepared in advance for us to do. And that word workmanship is poema in the Greek. It's where we get our English word poem. We are the stanzas of God's love and grace and even his judgment. We are the stanzas of God's heart to the world. He's writing himself through us. But that comes after the reality that there's nothing we can do to write ourselves with God. Jesus had to do that. So Paul prayed, I'm involved in this process, and I, uh, I've talked about it a little bit. But today, I want to posit for you uh, sort of a foundation or overarching reason for what we're going to talk about. And then we're going to look at each letter of BLESS, B-L-E-S-S, the next few weeks together. It's my contention that this process is what every person is looking for, and I'll talk more about that. This is not to make other people a project. This is to be who you are. And, and to accept the reality of where you find yourself. You know, in Acts, Peter, the apostle, preached a sermon, and he said that we, he said that people live when they do, where they do, by God's design and desire. You wake up in the 21st century in Craig, Colorado, because that's what God wanted, and he did it on purpose. And the passage goes on to, to say that God did that so that people would find him, even though he's not very far away. But God has planted you. If you know Christ as your Savior, he's planted you now here because you're how he draws people to himself. And so that's um, kind of the basis for what we're going to talk about. So in terms of this idea of bless, I want you to turn with me to Genesis chapter 12. And I want to read the first three verses. Now, this is the story in, in early on after the creation, after the fall, um, and a, a man named Abram has showed up in the scene, and um, he has a relationship with God. And this is what God said. Genesis 12, beginning at verse 1. Now, the Lord said to Abram, this is before God changed his name to Abraham, the Lord said to Abram, go from your country and your kindred and your father's house and to the land I will show you, and I will make you a great nation. 
I will bless you and make your name great so that you will be a blessing. I will bless those who bless you and him who dishonors you I will curse and in you all families of the earth shall be blessed. A part of this is re- repeated numerous times throughout the Old Testament. It's why we're convinced that we should continually be lifting Israel up because God has said to the nation of Israel, Abraham was blessed to be a blessing through his family, which ultimately became the nation of Israel. Abraham, Isaac, Jacob, Joseph, and it continues on. And God says, I will bless those who bless you and I will curse those who curse you. That's even in the midst of the reality that the nation of Israel isn't always following God the way they should. We're, we're called to bless the people of Israel. Well, this passage in, in Genesis chapter 12 is very specifically uh, a promise, a prophecy through God given to Abraham and to his descendants. But the reality is, as we'll see, the ultimate fulfillment is found in Christ and us. Let's look at Galatians 3, beginning at verse 13. This is the Apostle Paul writing to the church in Galatia. Energized by the Holy Spirit, he says this, Christ redeemed us from the curse of the law by becoming a curse for us. For it is written, cursed is everyone who is hanged on a tree. So that in Christ Jesus, the blessing of Abraham might come to the Gentiles. So that we receive the promised spirit, so that we might receive the promised spirit through faith. Now the promises were made to Abraham and to his offspring. It does not say to offsprings, referring to many, but referring to one. And to your offspring, who is Christ. This is what I mean. The law, which came years afterward, does not annul the covenant previously ratified by God, so as to make the promise void. For if the inheritance comes by the law, it no longer comes by promise but God gave it to Abraham by a promise. Why then the law? It was added because of transgressions until the offspring should come to whom the promise had been made. So then the law was our guardian until Christ came in order that we might be justified by faith. But now that faith has come, we are no longer under a guardian. For in Christ Jesus, you are all sons of God through faith. And if you are Christ, then you are Abraham's offspring, heirs according to the promise. Now that's pretty long and it would take a a couple of sermons to really unpack that, but here's the bottom line. Abraham was blessed by God to be a blessing to the world. But the ultimate promise through that is that it was referring forward to Christ. And so that all who would believe and receive Christ, believe on and receive Christ, would now be that promise of being blessed to be a blessing to the world. So this morning I want to look at the promise clarified, how the promise continues, and then I want to look at the promise currently, especially currently with us. If you really look at the promise that was given to to, um, Abraham, this clarification of this is that there were actually five promises given to Abraham in Genesis 12. There was a promise that he would make Abraham a great nation. He would give him a great name. And then there's, there's a great statement that he would be a blessing. And then there's the ramification of that, that it, he would bless, um, let's see how it reads exactly. I will bless those who bless you and dishonor, the, those who dishonor you I will curse. 
So there's a ramification of the reality that God has blessed Abraham in such a way that he's a blessing to others, that the others should be acknowledging that blessing. And then it ends with the great promise. And in you, all the families of the earth will be blessed. There's five individual blessings found in that promise from Abraham to God. The really interesting thing is that there's five curses found in the first 11 chapters of Genesis. Five curses because of the rebelliousness and wickedness of man found in Genesis 1 through 11. And in Genesis 12, God chooses a man and deposits upon him five promises and blessings. And we'll talk more about that in a minute. You see, the promise continues. The ultimate fulfillment of this promise is in Christ. And God intends to reverse the curse through Christ, who is the offspring. Think about it for a minute. God takes this man, and he says, I'm going to bless you. You're going to be a great nation. I'm going to give you a great name. Ultimately, I will bless all the families of the earth through you. Now, if that was just about this man, this human being, Abraham, what, what's the blessing that we could receive? It could be prosperity. It could be peace here on earth. It could be very temporal reality. You see, the ultimate promise that God is giving here is to the and through the offspring that would come. You see, you got to remember this is on the heels of the reality that Adam and Eve chose to sin in the garden. And because they sinned, sin entered the world and death through their sin. So the ultimate and only way to truly bless the families of the world, of the earth, is not in a physical, tangible blessing as we would think of giving to a man, Abraham, but an eternal blessing that would only come through God. God himself, who takes on the form of humanity in the person of Jesus Christ, lives a sinless life, dies a horrible death, is buried, experiences that death, and raises from the dead three days later to conquer sin, hell, and death. That's the ultimate promise. That's the blessing that God is actually giving to Abraham through Abraham to us, if you will. In what we read earlier, Genesis 3.1, Christ redeemed us from the curse of the law. The reality of the blessing that is given to Abraham in Genesis is actually looking forward to the offspring, which is Christ, and those who would receive him now become the benefactors of that blessing, if you will. You see, the ultimate blessing is not prosperity here on earth, not long life, not peace. The ultimate blessing is eternal life through Jesus Christ, our Lord. That is the blessing. But I'd like to talk about the blessing currently, and the reality is that if you've received Christ as your Savior, you have been blessed Is it a blessing to turn from yourself and your sin and receive Jesus and live forever? Is that a blessing? I know Andrew's not up here, but you could say whoop, whoop or something. Anyway, listen, in Christ, we have been blessed to be a blessing. When, When God blesses Abraham, he says, Abraham, I want you to go. Leave your people, leave the land that you know, and go. And he doesn't tell him where to go. To us, Jesus said, all authority in heaven and earth has been given to me. Therefore, you go and make disciples of all nations, baptizing them in the name of the Father, the Son, and the Holy Spirit, and teaching them to observe whatsoever I have commanded. We have been commissioned and blessed in the same manner in which Abraham was. We have been blessed to be a blessing. 
You see, when, when you choose to receive Christ, um, God does not When you receive Christ, God does not take you out of the world. Sorry, let me try this again. Heard there we go. Is that better? When you receive Christ, God does not take you out of the world. I, I mentioned a funeral we uh, held here not too long ago for a woman named, um, I forgot her name. No, Ellen McMichael. Thank you for that. We read at her funeral some words that she penned uh, in the last few days of her life. And... Um, she was uh, in her 80s when she passed, but she, she received Christ when she was 26 years old. The, the light bulb went off and stuff she had heard from the Bible and from churches and being involved with Christians finally made sense and she realized that she needed Jesus because he who has the son has the life. He who does not have the son does not have the life. She received Christ at age 26 and she said she was so elated and overjoyed and so uh, excited about spending eternity in heaven with God that she said there was one, one, just, I don't know if you've ever experienced that, just, just to escape the difficulty of this world. Jesus said, in this world you will have trouble, and he's been proven correct. Now, when you receive Christ, God doesn't take you out of here. He leaves you here, even though the world's a difficult place. He writes the stanzas of his heart through your life. You are his workmanship. God leaves us here because that's part of his plan and his process. He leaves us here so that we would be a light in our sphere, in our community in our world. And that's what BLESS is really about. The, the acronym um, for our purposes is this. The B is begin with prayer. See, and I'm going to talk more about this at the end. So um, the B is begin with prayer. The L is listen. The E is eat. The S is serve and the other S is share. This is how we should live our lives. This is how God wants to work in and through us. This is what the world is looking for. If you look at the ministry of Jesus, um, he, he had some very large meetings. There were multitudes. And he shared his heart that God sent him, that he was the son of God, and that, that people needed to acknowledge him as such. He did that to some very large groups, but most of Jesus' life and ministry was with very small groups or one person. It was doing exactly what I just said here. Jesus began his days with prayer. There's so many scenes of Jesus going off by himself and praying, sometimes all night long. Jesus listened well. If you look at Jesus' interactions verbally, he asked a lot of questions because he was listening to what people were saying. And he ate. There's so many scenes of Jesus eating with others. I love the King James. They sat at meat. Well, we need to do more sitting at meat. And then there's serving. It's serving others. Jesus came, said, I came not to be served, but to be a servant. And then there's the aspect of sharing. When everything's put together correctly and the fruit is ripe, you share the reality. 
we're, we're going to talk about all of these um, letters, the acronym, over the next few weeks. Today, I want to begin with the B, begin with prayer. There's a really interesting, um, well, let, let me say a couple things first. First of all, these, um, this call that I'm giving you today, this admonition, this call to action is for you to live life. It's to, it's to bless. It's, it's because you're blessed, you're to be a blessing to others. Now, these blessed practices are not linear. In other words, you don't, you don't um, say, okay, um, this week uh, I started praying for somebody, and so next week I have a conversation with them and I listen to them, and then the next week I, I eat with them, and then the next week I find a way to serve them, and then the last week, okay, I, I share my faith. This, these are practices that happen in the normal course of life. If you look at Jesus' life and ministry, there were times when he immediately went to the sharing part. There were, there were, these did, did not happen in a certain scripted order all the time. Now, it, it can, and that's wonderful if they do, but they're not intended to be linear. This is to be markers of your life. Now, of course, you should begin with prayer for sure. That is the foundation and the first. And any time you're in conversation with somebody, you need to listen. And then when you have opportunity, you share a meal with somebody. We need to be serving others continually. And we need to share our faith as we have opportunity. So I just don't want you to think that this is some kind of process that happens one, two, three, four, five, necessarily. These blessed practices were modeled by Jesus. Again, if you look at his life and ministry, this is, this is how he operated. And these blessed practices are desired by people. You know, people don't just want a friendly church. They don't just want a friendly grocery store. They don't want to f- just want a friendly workplace. People want a friend. And we need to become a friend to others. And these blessed practices are not intended to make people a project. This is to be a genuine outgrowth and outpouring of the reality of how we live our lives. Not that we're identifying a, a person who somehow becomes our project. This whole process begins in prayer. And I wanted to um, talk about uh, a poignant story in the life of the ministry of Jesus. He had empowered and commissioned his disciples to be able to do the things he was doing, proclaim the good news, set the captives free, that the blind would receive sight and people with infirmities could be healed. And God did some amazing things through the disciples. But there was one scene where when Jesus came on the scene, a father says to him, Jesus, I brought my son to your disciples. He has epilepsy, some of the versions say. A demon seizes him and throws him into the fire. And I brought him to your disciples, and they could not heal him. And Jesus ends up healing the boy. After the scene and when they're alone, the disciples ask Jesus, how come we weren't able to heal him? I want you to remember Jesus commissioned them and empowered them to do the ministry that he was doing. And Jesus said, this kind only comes out by prayer. That's the account in Mark. One of the other gospels says, this kind only comes out by prayer and fasting. 
And Jesus gave us a, a real uh, picture and a, a model for how we're to live life and do ministry. You know, maybe there's somebody in your life that does not yet know Jesus as their Savior. And the first thing that needs to take place is that you're praying for them. See, because unless, unless God draws them, no one comes to the Son. Unless God does some kind of work, nobody comes to faith. And Jesus said to the disciples, this kind, this person, this situation is only remedied through prayer. And if you think about somebody that you know that you're burdened for, that doesn't yet know Christ, that person will only come to faith through prayer. I stand here today a follower of Christ because of um, at least two, uh, besides my parents, two ladies in my life. One was a woman named Aline Silver, and another was my grandmother. And those two ladies who didn't really know each other, my grandma lived in Kremlin, Aline lived here, they prayed for me that I would come to faith, that I would walk in, in the ways of God. I remember um, in about 1980, I was part of a small group, and we were identifying people that, that um, we wanted to see God work in their life, and we were praying for them. And for me, the, the primary one at that point was my younger brother. And he was not in a good place in his life, and um, he was working in the oil field and involved in everything that comes along with that. And he uh, just was not exhibiting a life of somebody who was following God. And I was praying concertedly. I was actually fasting and praying often in burden for my little brother. And this went on for probably six months. And I just, I prayed concertedly. And one night at about midnight, Cheryl and I got a phone call, and it was my little brother, and he was living in Colorado Springs at the time. And he, he said, he said, Leonard, you'll never guess what happened. And I said, what? And he said, I became a Christian tonight. I said, well, what, ha what happened? He said, I went to a Nikki Cruz con concert or Nikki Cruz um, event. So if you've ever read The Cross and the Switchblade, um, Nikki Cruz was prominent in that story. And he said, if, everything I've heard all my life finally made sense. And he said, I just broke down. And I said, I said, God, have mercy on me. I'm a sinner. I need Jesus in my life. And you know what I said? I spent six months. And you know what I said? No way. <laughs> this kind only comes out by prayer. Now, this morning, we're going to end our time with communion. It's an opportunity to acknowledge the reality of Jesus' broken body. We have bread. Jesus said, this bread is my body, and he broke it. And after giving thanks, he dispensed it to the disciples. And as they ate it and made it part of him, part of them, it was a picture of the reality of the need to receive Jesus. And after that supper, he took a cup, and he said, this is the cup of the new covenant found in my blood. As often as you drink this, do it in remembrance of me. And so we have an opportunity this morning to, to pause and to reflect on what Jesus went through. We share an open communion here, which simply means if you've received Jesus as your Savior, whether you're a member of this church or not, whether you've been baptized here or not, if you've received Jesus, you are invited to this table to publicly declare that Jesus is Lord.